I just want to say thank you all for coming out. I know you had other things you could be doing today. Uh, and so I'm, I'm glad that you're here. I'm going to do my best to uh, keep everybody's eyes open uh, and, and engaged with this. Uh, I do have to stand here. I can't pace, which is my natural state of being. And so if you see some like vibrating nervous energy from me, that's where that's coming from. I feel like I need to move around and can't do it, but that's, that's all right. Um, but uh, so I just wanted to start out. Uh, let's take a look at this title. All right. The title's a mouthful. I, I admit that it's a lot. Right. But it takes up like three lines on my resume. And so that was really the whole <laughs> thing to really stretch that out, bloat it up a little bit. Um, so right wing religiously motivated violence in the U.S. current status transit, a case study in the radicalization process. That case study part is really going to take up most of this presentation. Uh, as, as Vic says, you know, I've done a lot of work in my career. A lot of it is very quantitatively heavy, pretty nerdy stuff. And so this is a departure for me as well. Um, but uh, and so th this case study thing is going to be switching gears a little bit, but uh, I hope it goes over well. Uh, so I guess the, the, first, the first thing I want to get out of the way is wh why, 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 why are, you, why are you talking about this? Why? What, what is it about this? Um, like, why even, why even try this? Um, but before I get to that, we're in El Paso, you know? This is like one of my mom's favorite albums. She still has this. I called her. Like, do you still have that album? Because I listened to it all the time when I was a little kid. El Paso and Big Iron. I've listened to those songs a thousand times. And so I told her I was going to put this slide up here. And so I'm delivering on that promise to my mom. OK, so hopefully she's very happy with that. Um, and so if y'all want to break out in song at any time with this, that's, that's fine with me. I'm totally OK with that. Uh, but why? OK, let's get back to the question. Why? Why? Why this particular issue? And it's that picture right there is why I'm interested in this. OK. And so I don't know if you've seen this, this picture a lot. It's, it's, a, it's a screenshot from a video. They show it on Cops a lot. OK. So just to, to give you a little history of this, I, in 1996, I know that was a very long time ago, 1996, I left the, the Spokane, Washington era, area in a 1990 Ford Escort, loaded down with like my clothes and, and a 500-pound and a, and a RCA color TV. Remember those old TVs, how huge those things were? They were you had to, like five people had to carry them around. I, I carted one of those in a Ford Escort for 2,000 miles because I felt like I needed to, which is just nuts. But OK, so, so as you see from the timestamp on the bottom, all right, so February of, of, of 97. And so um, I, was, I was sitting in my apartment in Cincinnati where I just started the first year of the PhD program there. I didn't know anybody, really. You know, I, I just moved 2,000 miles. And I'm sitting in my apartment in a white wicker chair with my RCA color TV laying on the floor, watching TV. And I was watching the news, and all of a sudden, this video pops up of these two guys popping out of that, that blue Suburban. A lot of rounds get fired, very close quarters. No one got hit, which is amazing. All right. And so they're, you know, they're trading gunfire. And they show this a, a lot. This is a very popular clip now. But at the time, I'm just seeing this normal thing going on outside of Cincinnati, Ohio, right? And then they pop up a guy's picture. And it turns out it's this dude, a guy named Chevy Kehoe, OK? And I'm thinking to myself, there can't be two Chevy Kehoes in the world. There can only be one Chevy Kehoe. And the reason I know this is because I went to junior high with Chevy Kehoe in Kettle Falls, Washington, a town about as big as this room. Uh, I graduated in a class of 32 people, uh, a small little logging town up in the corner of Washington, Idaho, in Canada. You can throw a rock and hit either one of them. Uh, tiny, tiny little town. And Chevy Kehoe came to us in seventh grade from North Carolina, all right? And he was this bright kid. He was funny. He, we were friends with him. He was an honor student. Teachers liked him. He had a really thick, funny accent that we, we made fun of in a good way, you know? But that was Chevy. And he'd been to my house. His brother had been to my house. His parents had been to my house. Uh, and yet here he is in Cincinnati, Ohio, however many years later, it was like 1985, 86, 87, something like that, where we went to school together. And in 1997, here he is shooting at police officers. And I'm just like, what, what? 
I get on the phone immediately to call everybody back from the Kettle Falls, say, Chevy Kehoe shooting a police officer, Chevy Kehoe shooting a police officer. What, what happened here? Right? And so this, this is really what sparked my interest in this whole thing, right? Was this guy right here that I, I, I knew as a kid. And here, here he is now, right? And so that's where it started for me. That's the, that's the kid right in the middle there. That's Chevy as a, as a junior high kid at Kettle Falls. All right, and just for gratuitous purposes, there's that Pratt kid. <laughs> Eighth grade with braces and a football jersey. Good, good Lord, look at that picture. That's terrible. All right, but this is where it started for me, right? This is, this is where I, I knew this kid, right? And uh, at, at one point, uh, myself and, and, and another buddy named Bart Evans, this was in seventh grade, we decided to write a song about Chevy and his funny accent. We had to perform this at the seventh grade talent show at Kettle Falls Middle School, which we did. There were like five of us sitting on the edge of the stage and Chevy was behind us wearing overalls and a rocking chair and a big fake jug, jug of whiskey, right? That, that, and now he was in on it, right? And, that, and it, was in a, it was in a yearbook. And I spent like two weeks calling everybody up there trying to track down a copy of this yearbook and was unsuccessful. No one could seem to locate this because I know there's a picture of that and I would have loved to have given that to you guys because it's awesome, but it, it, it wasn't going to happen. So I decided to go with my eighth grade photo instead because that's even more embarrassing for me. So um, perfect. So this, but this is where it started, right? And so we were in okay, seventh, eighth grade and around ninth grade or so he went to the neighboring town and by 10th grade he had been pulled out of school and we didn't hear much about it, right? We, you know, we kind of lost touch with him. This was before cell phones, you know, and so you, you can't get a hold of everyone that you want to. And, uh, and around 10th grade or so, it's like, oh, he's, he's out of school. And then we'd heard that he'd started to get in with the kind of white supremacist polygamist movement. And we're like, what? Chevy? What? Again, didn't think a whole lot about it. You know, it was, it was kind of weird. We thought, well, that's, that's a little strange. And then that was literally the last we'd really heard of him until 1997 when he's popping out of a blue Suburban emptying his gun at folks, right? And so, um, and this is where it got real bad, all right? This is, the, this is Bill Mueller and his family. And this is what Chevy was on the run for. So, and I'll get into some of the more details later, uh, but to suffice it to say, he, uh, he and an accomplice robbed this family. The, the Bill Mueller guy was part of the same kind of white supremacist militia movement that Chevy was involved in. And Chevy and a buddy dressed up like police officers and raided the home and stole firearms, cash, coins, all that kind of stuff, put bags over the heads of all three of them, asphyxiated them, killed them and dumped their bodies in the Illinois Bayou River. Then they were discovered about six months later by a fisherman. All right. So this is where, this is where it, let me see if I can, that's where it started, <laughs> right? And this is where it went, right? And so to me, this, this was the question driving all this. How do you get from there to there, all right? How do you get from junior high, honor student, teachers loved him, he was in the gifted education program, bright kid. How do you go from there to this, to this thing. And, and I, I'm, at the time, it's like, you know, late 1990s. I'm getting a PhD in criminal justice. Of course, it's right in my alley. Right, I'm learning all this stuff, like, like all this stuff that I'm learning in books and in articles and from professors and everything else. I'm trying to like filter that through this. Like, what, how, how can this help explain this kid that I grew up with? I mean, how do you, how do, you do that? How do you wrap your head around that? All right, and so that's, that's really the question uh, for this. And so I also want to say that if at any time during this presentation y'all have questions, raise your hand, come up. I don't, you don't need to keep that stuff till the end. We can have a conversation here. We're all grown ups. We're fine. Right. Um, and so that's, that's where this stuff is at. And um, he, Chevy was in a federal facility in Virginia. And about five years or so ago, I got a letter from him out of the blue. Just, just appeared. Like, what, what is this? And it was from some facility in Virginia. I'm like, what is this? And I open this up and it's a letter from Chevy. And the first thing he said when he started out says, well, it looks like we ended up in the same field, just other sides of the wall, I guess, you know. 
Okay, I guess that's one way of putting it. <laughs> um, uh, but he still had that sense of humor that was running through it. Um, he's now in a, in a Supermax facility in Colorado. Uh, and I got one letter from him after that. I, it, it's tough to get communication in and out. Um, but uh, um, so that's where he is now. And, and so really this is just, this whole thing is really just me trying to make sense of this. This is, the, this is a straight up vanity project. I'll admit that, um, that I'm just trying to figure out what happened with him, where did things go wrong, where were their potential turning points, and what might we be able to take away from it that's more general, that's outside of his particular situation and his circumstances. What, is, is there something broader we might be able to learn? And I hope, I hope the answer to that question is yes, maybe by the end of this presentation, hopefully. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's where we're at with this. But I, I do want to give you some, a little bit of hard data. Not a lot. I'm not going to throw a whole bunch at you. Um, but I just wanted to, to, to be very clear that when we, when we start thinking about politically motivated violence, it's not confined to the right wing at all. all right, this is something that exists across the political spectrum. That doesn't necessarily mean it's weighed the same or, or, or plays itself out in the same way. But there is, there is a, a wide spectrum of ideologies that promote violent behavior. Uh, and so I, I, I don't want to, to neglect that part of it. It isn't that I'm disinterested in it or anything like that. I'm just, I'm just very interested in this little slice of things, right? Um, and so what, what we see here, this is some, some newer data that, that most of this stuff is still happening from the far right at, at this point. Um, in terms of target selection, you can see that, that this, the, the violence coming from the right is a bit more eclectic, but the, I mean, the broad categories are still government and protests, right? I mean, protesters in, in particular. But if you're on the far left or the far right, and if you have violent proclivities, other protesters seem to be a, a, a pretty attractive target to you. And that, that shouldn't be a surprise, right, uh, at this point. Um, if you look at some trends over time, this is a really interesting chart, because uh, if you see the, the, the yellow dots are the right wing violence and the, the, the blue one, blue grayish ones are, are, are violent left wing. But I, I, I find myself a lot lately beginning sentences with, I'm old enough to remember when, hmm. and it happens a lot, it happens a lot, especially when I see these teenagers wearing like Def Leppard t-shirts and Guns N' Roses t-shirts, and like, I remember when that first came out. You know, and so, uh, so I rem if you remember those early 2000s days of post-Patriot Act, you had a lot of kind of violent protests from the left about that, right? And so that's why you're seeing that cluster here uh, from the left. But here's 2015 that really kind of kicked off our more contemporary time with this, right? Um, and so this, it's definitely occurring with more frequency now, and most of that is coming from... Uh, the right side. Uh, and again, if you're looking at trends over time, firearms are still the weapon of choice from either side of the political spectrum. This just seems to be the, the weapon of choice for sure. Um, Dr. Yes, sir. Uh, a couple of slides back to all the, uh, the clusters. Yep. Uh, social media have an impact on that? I would, say, I would say it's tough to say no on that, yeah. That, that, uh, in, in particular, given the way that, that groups on the left and the right communicate with one another, right? That there's a certain amount of, uh, of coordination that goes on from both sides of that, uh, in that it allows you to plan better, it allows methods, it allows all that kind of stuff uh, in terms of communicating and, and coordinating. So for sure, social media has helped. I'm not, I think it's an open question whether or not it has sparked any additional Incidents it may have, right? Uh, I think that's an open question, and I think there's probably some pretty compelling evidence that it, that it probably has contributed to it. Um, but I think what, what, what media has done, the social media has done, is just it's allowed people to collectively act in a bit more of a concerted way than they were before, right? Um, but yeah, that's a good question. I'd like to... Uh, it'd be tough to, to get after that, right? Because, you know, social media kind of came out at around the same time as, as a lot of this stuff was coming in. So I, to, to what extent are these kind of coexisting in time versus causal? I'm not, I'm not sure, but it's a good question for sure. And to gather that data, what was used, like what type of events fell within? Yeah, a, a lot of the, yeah, that's a good question. A lot of the stuff um, it draws on data from the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, and so they, they keep track of hate groups around the country uh, pretty carefully. And they compile a lot of data. Uh, no, nope. 
I, I, could be absolutely, it could be skewed. Uh, and they, and so, and what 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 could skew it is the definition of a hate group, right? Is is where it's like, okay, if if someone does some sort of what seems to be an ideologically motivated um, incident, right? Are they part of a hate group? Are they not? That becomes kind of a, so there's some definitional ambiguity there for sure. And if, if you want to assign that, okay, well, this person clearly was a member of this group. Well, were they, or were they not? There may be some evidence, there may be some good evidence, there may be some shaky evidence. Um, but one of the things that, that we can certainly see with this is that the incidents are getting more frequent, right? And I think if, if, you, if, you, if you want to look at the balance of left to right, there's probably a confidence interval that should be placed around that for sure. Most of the time, believe it or not, it's very clear. Um, if, you, if you're talking about uh, violence that has a political motivation, it's usually right out in front. Um, it, but the, the, the question, I think, this goes back to your point too, which is, is, was it coordinated, right? Or was this just happened to be a person who did this that seemed to have a particular set of ideological beliefs but really weren't part of any broader movement or any organization? That's where it starts to really get difficult to tease that out, right? And, and so, because it could be someone who is by himself, who maybe was consuming certain social media that, that had a particular ideological bent to it, but they weren't really interacting with anyone. And we see that in, 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 in multiple incidents, right? That, okay, this is a guy, he did this incident, he was, he was looking at this stuff, he was on this website, he was looking at this, but he was really by himself, right? And so how, how, do we, how might we go about classifying that, right? It's where, where the ideological motivation is probably pretty clear, but what's not clear is to what extent was this a coordinated effort? Was it an isolated effort on, on the part of one person? That's, that's actually that's a lot more difficult to tease out. And that involves some judgment calls, right? And, and anytime you, you, you put in some, a, a judgment call like that, there's, there's room for error, for sure. And, and, if you, and if you start that question from an ideological standpoint, like if you already have an agenda when you ask that question, that's going to lead you to a particular answer, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sort of response to I, I am a political communication scholar. I, I specifically study social media and share what my project on. Cool. Specifically with Twitter right now. I think an interesting facet of the question of coordination, like social media as a tool for coordination, is if you are sort of a communication scholar with the sort of mind of that, that the patterns don't change, only the tools used to do them. Um, I didn't exist back before cell phones, really, so I can't really confirm. <laughs> I'm old enough to remember when. <laughs> so I, I, yes. I think what we seem to forget is that hate groups have always had methods of organizing with the communication tools of their time. Yeah. The difference between, say, the, the post Cambridge Analytica uh, side of social media is that we as the public get to see these sort of actions taking place now. Right. Um, we don't now, after, in the aftermath of like the Charlottesville, uh, uh, gathering, for example, because all these groups have either been banned off of like the most visible public squares, or um, do this really smart thing where they just create private groups on Facebook so we don't all get to see their right. So I think it's a really interesting um, level of analysis to think, not necessarily is social media to blame for this, but how are social media platforms being utilized? How are these right. leaders taking advantage of no, and that's a great question. I, I, I'm convinced that what we see on Facebook groups or Twitter is, is tip of the iceberg stuff, right? That, that, that what, what these groups allow to be seen is tiny compared to the amount of communication that they, uh, other methods that they use. And they, they still go old school. There's still a lot of post office letters and stamps that get done with this stuff, right? And, and these, these groups, and particularly on the, right, on the political right, have been, and have been using computers in one form or another since the early 80s for their communication. And so this is, it's a long-standing thing for sure. Um, that's a good point. Good point. Where are we at? We're okay. Let's let's take some broad takeaways here. All right. I want to be very clear again that this happens across the political spectrum. That, that this is not confined to the right wing at all. That, that this really does cover the extremes on both ends right now. Uh, and there are certain times of our history where certain groups have been a little more active than others. Right. Um, we seem to be in a period right now, uh, in, in recent years, where, where more of the stuff seems to be coming from the right. That could change. You never know. Um, I was just talking with some, 
some colleagues here about, uh, I spend most of my time in, in the Spokane area. And uh, we had some, some incidents this last year with, with Antifa coming over from Seattle. And, and we all kind of knew it was coming. I mean, they were, they were tracking vans and vehicles and everything. It was like there was this big advance announcement of Antifa's coming, Antifa's coming, right? And downtown Spokane got ransacked pretty good. Uh, a lot of downtown businesses got destroyed, windows got thrashed in. Uh, but uh, so that was, Spokane's response was kind of like, are, are, you re are they really coming? Is this, is, this, is this a thing that's really happening? Uh, and it did. And in, in true Idaho fashion, because Idaho, Idaho is right across the border, so Coeur d'Alene, Idaho is right across uh, the border from Spokane. Coeur d'Alene handled that very differently, uh, to say the least. Uh, Coeur d'Alene's response, I don't know if you've been up into that area at all in, in the country. It's a gorgeous, beautiful area. Uh, but Coeur d'Alene as a, as a town armed itself to the teeth completely. I mean, you, they had it up on the news and, and they had like news crews down there and they had like news vans coming down the streets and the entire main street, every, there was, it was standing room only. Everyone was fully armed, fully armed. Um, automatic weapons, everything, every, the whole, all the, all the, all the gang, the gang was all there, right? Every, every, every weapon you could think of was, was there and they were, they were, they were ready. And their attitude was, this is not happening here, period. And it didn't. <laughs> uh, Antifa decided that they weren't going to travel eight miles east from Spokane into Coeur d'Alene, that they thought better of that uh, particular move. Um, so it's, it was, it's, uh, man, it's, what a time to be alive, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, um, and so it's, uh, and, and I don't think we're done with it. We've got a midterm election coming up, and we've got another election in 2024. I don't see this stuff slowing down at all. Uh, I see this kind of continuing. Um, complex problem, for sure. Um, but let's, let's, let's get back to Chevy. Let's, let's, let's get back to Mr. Kehoe on this. And so, uh, how are we doing on time? We, we're good? Okay, all right. All right. I promise not to keep anybody late. Right? We're, we're going we're gonna to finish this thing on time. We're going to roll. Okay, all right. That is my promise to you all. All right. Because uh, I, I don't want to be like, you know, an hour and 50 minutes into this and look out here and see you guys doing this stuff, like, you know, looking at your phones or whatever, right? Okay, we'll keep this going. So to, to fully understand Chevy, there's, there's, I would argue there's three, three really important components here. And the, the first is this broader, for, for lack of a better term, the white power movement that, that he was in and really that his father was in. You can't understand Chevy without understanding Chevy's dad. Um, and so that's, that's really the, the second thing that's, that's critically important in his life is to understand that immediate familial context that he grew up in and, and how that influenced him in, in significant ways. Um, and, then, and the third thing is where this kind of coalesces, again, for lack of a better term, I'm calling this the toxic trilogy of, of a very particular brand of religion. Uh, that's intimately tied to both racism and firearms. Like those three things in, in that particular movement really coalesced in a fundamental way. That for, 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 this, for this movement that Chevy was entrenched in, you can't separate out any one of these three. They are all central to his identity, central to his father's identity, central to the community that he, he runs in, right? And so, um, I'm just trying to get and stay on time, we're good. We're a little ahead of schedule, meaning that there's plenty of questions. If you have questions, pop up. So let's talk about this white power movement because this, this, this provides the kind of broader context for, for this, this entire, entire movement countrywide, especially on the, on the, the kind of right-wing militia side. And the Vietnam War is absolutely critical to this movement, right? This isn't to say that the white power movement didn't exist before that. Absolutely it did. It of course did, especially in the South with the KKK. All of that stuff was, was obviously very present long before the Vietnam War, but the Vietnam War was different, right? It had a different set of influences. Uh, and and, and, and the, the big thing here is, is how it united different generations that used to not like one another, right? If you look at that, the, the World War II generation that 
um, that really contributed a lot to the, to the KKK movement down south. They didn't like Nazis. That generation went to World War II to fight the Nazis. And so when you saw this kind of resurgence of the, the neo-Nazi movement among the younger generation, the World War II folks didn't like that. Like, oh, well, we're not cool with that at all. I went over to Germany to fight the Nazis. I don't want to come back to the United States and have to see that here. Right? So there was, a, there was a big friction between those generations up until the Vietnam War. Right? And it was the Vietnam War that, that coalesced all of that. Right? So this, is, this was really the shared goal right, of, of the, the kind of different generations and different movements that coalesced after the Vietnam War was we need to save this country. We've got to save this country from the communists, from the liberals, from whomever. Right? This was a, a very... A unifying kind of event that happened where there was this shared goal. And this, this idea of save the United States, this is really, really important. <laughs> um, because that was, a, that was, again, this shared goal that everyone could kind of rally around, get rid of their differences politically and, and procedurally, right? Because they had this unified goal of we need to save America. So that's the first one that we need to understand because Chevy's father was a Vietnam vet. And Chevy's father, Kirby is his name, came back from Vietnam, very entrenched in this movement, extremely entrenched in this movement. The second thing that happened, Greensboro, North Carolina, 1979, okay? So in that year, it was a crazy year in North Carolina, which is odd because again, this is Chevy Kehoe's home state, but in terms of the, of the broader movement, um, so in July, there was a showing of, the, of, of this movie called The Birth of a Nation in China Grove, North Carolina. You ever heard of this movie, Birth of a Nation? It's, psychotic would be a very appropriate term for Birth of a Nation, right? And it, it's really the, the, the basic premise is that you've got a, 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 a white, God-fearing family community huddled in fear in their homes as mobs of communist black people raid them and try and kill them. Essentially, and they're, that's that's the that's the Cliff Notes version of that. I mean, but it's it's very it, so it's it, it it spoke very clearly to that white power movement of well, we need to protect ourselves, we need to protect our women, we need to protect our children, um, and so uh, that happened uh, in in July, and there were a lot of protests outside of that movie that the the white folks who were putting it on didn't like. So there's uh, you know. Um, there, and, and later that year in November, there was, a, there was a death to the Klan rally that was a response to the showing of Birth of a Nation. And so there was this, in, in, in Greensboro, there was this big rally, uh, and it was again, anti death to the Klan rally, and the white power folks showed up very heavily armed and started opening fire. Five people ended up being, being killed in this. Okay. And there were 14 members of the, of the Aryan Nation kind of white power movement that were arrested for this. They went on trial. The Greensboro 14 were all acquitted of this. And what this did, this, this added a certain level of boldness to the movement. That it was, in 79, okay, we can do this, we can clean house, and we're okay legally. Like, there, it, it, you can't understate or overstate, I don't know which is the right phrase here. Let me rephrase that whole sentence. It was super important, right? Super important that, that, it, that it added just a lot of confidence uh, to the movement, for sure. Um, and then this happened. The Aryan Nations World Congress in 1983. Okay. So this happened in Richard Butler's compound in Hayden Lake, Idaho, where I grew up in Kettle Falls, Washington. Again, if you had a decent arm, you could throw a rock and hit it. Okay. We didn't really know it was there. They kept it themselves. Um, and it's, it's rural Idaho, man. It is rural, big trees, big mountains, big lakes where you can hide, essentially. So they, they, Richard Butler built his compound there, and they, they kind of stuck to themselves. I mean, they really kept it in-house. Um, and I was, I was telling the colleagues again that uh, my wife's family moved up from San Jose, California in the early 80s, around this time. And uh, they're Native American, and her father is a police officer, and his, her father's buddy was, was, a, was an African American guy, police officer as well, and they all moved up there right next to this compound. 
They had no idea what they were getting themselves into, that you've got a Native American family and a black family right next to Richard Butler and his Aryan Nations compound. Never heard a peep out of them. Didn't even know it was there till later. Uh, and it's since become defunct. Uh, now there's a really big amusement park next to it now, yeah, Silverwood, uh, that has roller coasters that make you go upside down. I don't do that. I have no need to have my feet above my head. That's crazy. Um, but uh, so, th so, but this was this was really this was really important. This event was this event was critical to this white power movement because they declared war on the U.S. government, right? And so this is a big switch from that post-Vietnam attitude where we need to save America, save America from this. 1983 rolls around, they have this kind of uh, uh, meeting, this world conference, and, and the saving America was no longer on the table. That, that was no longer a goal, it was no longer a priority, quite the opposite. All right, that they were, they were essentially trying to kind of create their own and undermine the United States. They didn't want to have anything to do with the United States government anymore. And a couple of things, yes? Is there a specific idea or like theme or what happened for them to change from let's save America, which is to save our children, to now go against America? You know, that's a, that's a really good question. And I read a lot about that meeting. The details are, I, I wish there were more. Um, but I, I, I think... I think probably what happened is they took advantage of the movement that was already happening, right? That they're at that point, by the early 80s, this Save America from the Communist stuff had already started to fizzle. And I think there was this growing movement of, we just need to separate ourselves and, and just get away from that. And I think what this did was just solidify that particular idea. Richard, yeah. very decent understanding of the American political agenda, um, or policy agenda rather, between, in between, um, let's say, the Vietnam War and this time, um, you need to understand that the U.S. was in a sort of unprecedented uh, progressive political movement, where progressive politics was the main thing, which then served to push these Vietnam veterans, these Korean War veterans, these, uh, and these threatening patriots. Um, to the margins of society, where their ideals were pushed away. It wasn't until then, in the, 19, the late 1970s, with the Nixon and, and Ford administrations, and then in a couple more years with the Reagan administration, where we saw this hard shift back to the political environment that we sort of are still dealing with today. And so, you know, in some sense, so dealing with it, are in today, where these sort of anti-progressive agenda became mainstream again. Um, where I think an interesting bit of data that actually sort of backs this up was a few slides ago. If you notice that a majority of the violence taken from all sides of the uh, political spectrum was against the government. Um, Without diving too deep into the data, I would assume that a lot of left-wing violence, if you were to take it from, say, the 1960s and 1970s, was mostly probably against the government as a direct response to the Vietnam War. Um, following the end of those wars, there wasn't a sort of polarizing force from the government for people to rebel against, and thus they sort of turned their attention towards each other. Instead of protesting the Vietnam War, they protesting the protesters of the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. Uh, just as an example, I haven't thought of in all years of um, fighting the left wing demonstration, and vice versa. Um, so when we get to the 1980s with the Turner Diaries, um, I think this was sort of the culmination of these marginalized far right groups understanding that their movement is go is now being directly attacked by the government, while as the Reagan administration comes in. And while his policies may not have directly called out to them, um, this is why we call these sort of uh, uh, rhetorical strategy job workers. We saw a sort of shift in that time where these groups were sort of emboldened, where they were able to enact what they believed was right, just action. 
action to save the country. And then when it became visible, as we saw in Charlottesville, and the government sort of like says, you know what, never mind, actually, never mind, take that back. We don't want to be associated with this. It, it sort of creates a storm in New York City, which I think we're going to get to further down the, the, the uh, presentation. I'm not sure exactly what's going to be that No, no all, all of it is practice. No, it's all good. It's all good. Trump's got a question on the key provisions. What's that? Uh, I've got a question on the key provisions. Sure. The use of computer technology for communication and internet resistance. Sounds like today. It does, and that, and, and we've and that again. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure that that was a, a critical turning point with this because we're we're still dealing with this, right? And and so again, it was, it was the early '80s, wild west of computers, right? Um, and it stayed that way really until uh, what mid '90s, probably. I mean, I mean, you remember the early days of the internet, man? There was there was there was nothing. I mean, you, you could do anything. There was no. There was no regulation. It was it was absolutely crazy. And so from up until that time, absolutely. But this this notion of the leaderless resistance is really really important. With these guys that there was no you know even though that Richard Butler was the head of the Aryan Nations in, in Hayden Lake Idaho, they were they were pushing this idea of small individualized cells scattered all over the country with no real central leadership at all, right? And that was that was by design, right? So so if one unit kind of gets cut off in in Michigan or in Wisconsin or in Texas. Right, the others are unaffected by that. Right, it made coordination a little bit more difficult, obviously. Um, but this is this is still the model that we we share today. This this notion of leaderless resistance is still a, a really core part of this of this whole thing, absolutely. And you know, you, to to your point about um, this kind of backlash, I, I I'll agree with you and disagree with you on, on on a point. I'll agree with you that by the early 1980s, the the Reagan era really did solidify the kind of right-wing rhetoric on that in, in, in a number of ways. It wasn't just within this particular movement, but it was a, it was a, it was a direct response to that kind of progressive era stuff in, in the late 1960s. In the 1970s, there was a lot of conflict about that. I, I probably wouldn't characterize the 70s as a, as a progressive era. It had progressive elements, right? But nothing like the late 1960s. 1970s rolled around. There's a lot of conflict over that. Um, there, were, there were fights about... Um, uh, especially within the criminal justice realm, there, there were fights about how are we going to treat offenders? How are we going to sentence them to long? Are we going to rehabilitate them? Are we gonna, you know, There was a lot of kind of back and forth with this. By the time the 80s rolled around, a new movement had kind of politically taken hold, right? And, and, and the Reagan era is fascinating for a number of reasons, right? Um, but uh, and one of the, and this is a bit of a, a, a tangent, but I like tangents, so I'm going to go on it anyway. Uh, where it really transformed from a criminal justice standpoint, think of something about drug use and the relationship between drug use and crime, right? That they're very intimately twined. They always have been. We, we can debate on whether or not it's causal, like drugs cause crime, or sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes they're a product of the same thing, right? Um, but there's no doubt that, that prior to the 1980s, the dominant view of drug use, drug abuse, and those problems was much more kind of macro and contextual, that you have to understand the context that people live in. You have to understand their communities. You have to understand their families. You have to understand their life trajectories, right? It's complex. Right? It's this complex thing that surrounds drug use. And then the 80s rolled around, and Nancy Reagan gave us Just Say No, right? Remember those ads? Again, I'm old enough to remember the Just Say No commercials. But again, and we, we can laugh about this and think it's, it's, it's kind of odd, but the message is actually fascinating, right? So you take this idea of all the complexity that surrounds drug use, all the complex factors that go into this, and we now have a message that none of that matters. The only thing that matters, just say no. So they, that, that, that little phrase reduced drug use and crime in general away from a much more complex, multi-level, multi-factor problem to one problem of individual choice. And that transformed so much, criminal justice-wise, so much, that you can't, I mean, you can't under, underscore just, just how fundamental that switch was. Um, and again, what that also did in, in the context of this is when you, when you transfer away from broad social processes and institutions to this idea of individual responsibility, right, how that played into this, right? And so it, it's, it, it certainly did solidify in that, in that, in that early 80s, that, that conservative movement, and, and where, where a, a lot of kind of confidence and boldness really did emerge um, that wasn't necessarily there before. Um, all right, so okay, uh, back to this idea of the, like the three kind of 
broad things. We need to know the, the white power movement. The, this is the second one here, which is, there's Kirby. And Chevy, yeah, that's Kirby. So this guy, I remember he, he, uh, Chevy was at my house in seventh grade. I don't know what we were watching on TV. I, I, I couldn't tell you. It was probably, uh, probably an Atlanta Braves baseball game would be my guess because cable TV came to Kettle Falls in 1981. And so the Braves are on TV every day at 435. So everybody in my town became Dale Murphy fans. We all like Bob Horner, Rafael Ramirez, Chris Jambliss, all that group, you know. Uh, and so my guess is if, 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 I, if I was alive at 435 that day, I was watching the Braves. And so my guess is that we were doing. And then Kirby shows up in the biggest Jeep I'd ever seen, like CJ5 or 6 or something, I don't know, with like a 12-inch lift. It was obnoxious. Um, had you know, tires as big as my house. Uh, and I, rem I remember this later. At the time, it would just seem kind of a little strange, but I remember how quickly Chevy reacted when Kirby showed up. And like he, 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 he switched, switched gears. It was he went from being relaxed, enjoying himself, hanging out with his friends, to terrified that fast. And I just remember like, damn, like, wow. Wow, um, that, was, that was quick. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't think a whole lot of it because I'm Generation X and all of our fathers were like that. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't, wasn't that far out of things, but, you know, certainly as an adult and I can kind of telescope back and, and see, see what that reaction for, for what it was, right? Um, he, was, he was terrified of his dad, absolutely terrified. And so uh, to understand Chevy, you got to understand Kirby. Um, so, and, and, and very important to this was this Christian identity religion that, that surrounded all of them. And I don't know if you, how familiar you are with, the, with this Christian identity stuff. It's a, it's a, oh my God, it's a really interesting religion because there is no, there's no central theology to it. It's this strange kind of hodgepodge of we're going we're gonna to borrow this from this fundamentalist unit. We're going to borrow this little principle from fundamentalist Mormons. Or we're gonna, and then we're going to Frankenstein this together to, to, to have this, this kind of, I can, very strange Christian outlook. Um, but I, I tried to, I read a lot of this stuff. I, I, everything I could get my hands on with this. And it's, again, it's, it's interesting as hell. But, but one of the, they have a, a few core tenets that seem to be consistent through all of them that Kirby certainly attributed to. And it's the importance of Cain and the Cain and Abel um, story in the Bible, right? Cain in, in this Christian identity, at least the one that, that, the version of it that Kirby adopted was, okay, you know, Cain, Abel, Cain slew Abel, all the good, good stuff, right? But Cain, all right, Married an actual demon, not a, not a metaphorical demon, not a symbolic demon, an actual demon, okay? And this, the, the, the union of Cain and this demon spawned, in their mind, anyone that doesn't have white skin, right? So any, any race of people that is not white is a direct descendant of the unholy relationship between Cain and this unnamed demon. I shouldn't say unnamed. They had like three or four different names for it. Um, so no one can really agree on who the demon wife was. But it was a demon wife, and she spawned this whole non-white thing. Okay, so, that's, so that, that runs through this. And so just, I, I, and I say this because I, I'm trying as, 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 as carefully as I can to communicate just how loony this is. I, I mean, let's, let's just call it as we see it, right? This is this, to, to, to believe in that particular outlook is abnormal. But I'm a criminologist and I like deviants. I'm fascinated by deviants. And so I'm fascinated by this, like, wow, you believe that? That is not normal. <laughs> Say more, right? Um, and so that's where, that's where this came from. And this notion of, of, of course, because... Anyone with not, that doesn't have white skin is the spawn of Cain and this unholy union. Whites have dominion over everybody. And the word dominion is very important because Chevy really liked this word. And he clearly didn't get it from himself. Right? He got that from his papa. Right? This idea of white dominion over everything. And so they decided that, that Kirby, it was Kirby's idea first, to establish the 
People's Aryan Republic, sometimes it was called the Aryan Public, Aryan People's Republic, People's Aryan Republic. You ever seen Monty Python, The Life of Brian? The Judean People's Front? No, it's the People's Front of Judea. No one got that joke. Thank you. Thank you for those of you that are nodding, you're my people, right? And so, but that, that was really this idea that we're going to establish our own state. So again, go back to this idea from 1983, right? Declaring war on the US government, separate completely. And the Northwest was a great place to do it for them. They had their eye on Washington, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, that little circle up there uh, that I spent the first 18 years of my life. And so I can, see, I can see what's appealing to that, right? It's rural. There's a lot of open space. Land is cheap. And so they thought, okay, we can buy up a bunch of land. We'll start our own nation using polygamy. This is a very important part of this, right? The whole idea is, is, is Kirby and Chevy was encouraged to do this, take on multiple wives, have as many children as you can to populate the new country. It was really about driving the population of this new nation. And to do this, they engaged in all kinds of criminal enterprises, a lot of fraud, a lot of theft. They're, they're counterfeiting, trying to disrupt the, the currency of the United States. But this idea of fraud is super, super, super important. All right, super important. I'm going to return to that um, in just a second. But this is, this is Kirby. This is, your, this is your dad. All right. And at one point, so Chevy had a, a younger brother and some other siblings, a younger brother named Shane in particular, that uh, was, was kind of running with him when he was on the run. And, and Shane ended up testifying against Chevy in, in, his, in his trial. Uh, Shane was a, a, very, a very different kid than Chevy's quiet, um, looked up to his older brother. Uh, they both tried to please Kirby, but Shane, Shane didn't have the backbone that Kirby wanted out of his sons. Uh, Chevy was tougher. Chevy was a lot, a lot more receptive to those, uh, those messages that Kirby was saying. But at one point, because Shane was not kind of getting on board with this idea, Kirby floated the idea to Chevy to kill Shane. And, I mean, going straight up, Isaac and Abraham on him, right? I mean, and that, that was the first word where Chevy's like, dang, what? Chevy didn't. Chevy didn't kill his brother. But imagine growing up in that household, right? Imagine that that's where you spend your time. With a father that is now suggesting that you kill your brother because your brother isn't tough enough to run the movement. And so that's, that's where this kid... This kid was at. So to return to Chevy, so we understand now the kind of broader white power movement. We understand the familial context that he was in. And, you, and to, to, to go back to the original question of how do you get from here to here? How do you get from eighth grade, junior high kid, bright, funny, personable to this, right? There are certain turning points that ended up being really, really important for Chevy. And the first one is when he got pulled out of school. So around 10th grade or so is when his dad yanked him out of school because schools are just there to indoctrinate his children on communism and race mixing and everything else that he abhorred, right? Uh, and this was, a, this was a significant development because Chevy was good at school. He liked school. He had friends at school. But that wasn't okay with Kirby, so Kirby yanked him out of there, right? He tried to get out when he was... 1617, uh, he contacted an old teacher from Colville High School. So Colville was eight miles away from Kettle Falls. Contacted a, a science teacher there and asked him to help him run away to the Navy. He wanted to get the hell out of Kirby's house. He wanted to leave. And he asked this guy, could you drive me to the recruiting office so I can get out of here? And the teacher, because Chevy wasn't 18 yet, the teacher didn't feel comfortable doing that. He's like, I can't. I can't do that for you, man. I can't basically kidnap a 16-year-old kid and take him to the Navy office. I, he just couldn't do that. And this haunts that guy to this day. Uh, he's a retired teacher now. Uh, it, uh, I had a brief conversation with him, and this is how many, how many years later? 30 years later? And he, he still had a lot of trouble talking about it, like a lot of trouble talking about it. He, it was tough for him to even get that stuff out. Um, he feels incredibly guilty about this, that this was a turning point that he missed. 
that this was an opportunity to maybe put this kid's life on a different trajectory. And he, he you know, in his defense, he didn't have all the information that he needed. And so I can understand where he was coming from in that. And I mean, I mean how hard would that be? You're, you're a science teacher in a small rural Eastern Washington school and a 16 year old kid comes up and says, man, could you take me to the Navy, Navy office and get me out of here? I mean, what, what, would you, what would you do with that, right? How would, you, how would you behave in that, in that circumstance? That's a tough question. That's a, that's a lot to ask of another person. But at the end of the day, he didn't do it. And Chevy ended up going back with, it, with his pops. Um, but that was another missed turning point, I guess. That, that, that you, there's no counterfactual. We don't have a hot tub time machine. We can't go back and make things different. Um, but you can, you can imagine how his life would have turned out differently had he been able to make that change. So living in that small community there, mm -hmm. were authorities ever called in to any of the other members or whoever else was, was there? Were there any assault, family violence, any, anything like that? Yeah, that's a, man, that's a great question because here's, here's the unfortunate reality of that. So at that time, uh, my dad worked for the Department of Social and Health Services for about 30 years. And so he worked with that with abused kids. And we were a foster home. And so uh, we probably had 20, 30 kids that stayed with us um, that he had to remove from houses, right? That uh, kids were getting abused. And, and you know, so growing up, I, I, you know, some of the kids were quiet, didn't say a word. You know, we had a bedroom and they would go in and, and they wanted their space. And I'm like, okay, I, I got you, right? You know, you need your space, you have your space. Some of them were very talkative. Um, and some of the most horrific stuff you can imagine you know, um, happened to these kids. Um, God, I remember, uh, this is another tangent, but I'm going to go ahead and go on it. Um, what's the statute of limitations on assault in Washington? I don't know. You'll, you'll figure out why in a second. So I, uh, we were, I was 20, 22 and came back from college to Kettle Falls and I went to TJ's Tavern in Kettle Falls, Washington, uh, where they're very proud. They have this big sign that says, we speak Canadian. Uh, and uh, we were there playing, I was playing pool with my dad, and, uh, and I, I looked off to the side, and there's this guy that was just giving my dad the stink eye, hard. And, I'm, and I didn't know this dude. I'm like, what? I'm looking at this guy like, what? What's going on here? And my dad's a large man, 6'2", two, two and a quarter. He's a, he's a, he's a big boy. And, uh, and, I, and this guy wasn't. And I'm thinking, dude, you, you have bit off way more than you can chew here if you're eyeing this guy. Like, I've, I've, I've seen him thrash some people, you know, in my day. And this guy's looking like, okay. And I, I'm thinking to myself, good luck, buddy. Have at it, man. And he had a couple buddies with me. I, I, I would look at dad and like, what's this, what's, uh, what's, what's this guy over here? What, what's his problem? And dad said I had to take three of his daughters out of his house because he was abusing them sexually. And the guy's pretty pissed off at it. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then about, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. About 10 minutes later, there was a massive bar brawl. And it was a lot of fun. Um, uh, and I didn't get arrested, uh, and so that's good. And that's why I asked about the statute of limitations. And now this is being recorded. Damn it. Travis, what are you thinking? Um, but, but one of the, one of the uh, and, and we've seen this now with COVID, one of the things we saw, when, when, when there's issues of abuse, more often than not, it's the schools that pick up on that when it's kids, it's, it's, it's teachers, it's counselors that see what's going on and they report that. That reporting ends up going to a social worker where, where that gets investigated. Chevy wasn't in school, you know? And so it, it was, he was being homeschooled, it was all hidden. And so there, there, was no one to, there was no one to say anything because there's no one to witness anything. And we, we've actually seen, man, when COVID hit and you saw, again, this is, this is another tangent, when COVID hit and no one was in school anymore, you saw a lot of those reported incidents of child abuse just drop. Like, do you think that's not happening? Of course it's happening. But they're not in school. And so there's no one there to call them out on it, right? And I, I, we're going to be seeing the consequences of that for the next 10, 15 years, absolutely. And, and we, have, we have no idea how severe that's going to be. Um, but there, there's no doubt that that continued. But that, that was really the problem is that, yeah, there's a horrific abuse going on, but it wasn't being witnessed by anybody outside the household. Right. So did his teacher report that to CPC? No. So even though he's not a student, he's still a minor. Right, right. So he could he, have. Did he report? He could have, yeah. Did you have any evidence of abuse in, in the household, or was it just more like the dad being a terrorist? 
Um, from, 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 if I had to make a guess on that, because again, and this is pure speculation, Ted, man. I, I think Kirby had like a fifth degree black belt in psychological warfare. Man. I, th I think he just had an amazing ability to just intimidate and scare um, and just terrorize those kids and his wife um, that, that, so that no one would, would speak out against him. It was, uh, I, I think that's what was really going. There, there was probably a lot, some physical stuff, maybe even a lot of it, but I, I think that what was more consequential was just the, the fear that he had a, a, an ability to induce. I mean, he asked, him, he asked him to kill his brother. I mean, that in and of itself, I mean, man, try and wrap your head around that one. I mean, good God. Um, yeah, so, that's the, so he's pulled out of school, failed attempt. He, he, he jumped with both feet into this Christian identity thing. Ended up having multiple wives, started having kids right away. Um, but here's where it starts to get really interesting, all right? He joins Kirby in this insurance fraud scam. So Kirby knew Bill Mueller and his family. They ran in the same circles for gun shows and things like that. They knew that Kirby had, or, or that Mueller had a big stock of guns, ammo, cash, gold coins, you name it. So they hatched this plan to, uh, so Kirby and, and, and Bill Mueller hatched this plan together that Kirby would steal all this stuff and then Bill Mueller would um, claim insurance, right? I got theft, it was all this stuff was gone. So he would get the insurance money and they would keep the guns and ammo and everything else, right? And so that's what they did. Uh, and so they pulled that scam off uh, and then it seemed to be under Kirby's direction, although there's some, some denial on that, uh, where Chevy and another buddy decided that they, because they knew that Bill Mueller had all of this there, and you know, Chevy was kind of on the run with this, that he was gonna go ahead and actually steal what they had, right? That it was gonna be a way for them to fund the rest of their kind of criminal enterprise. So no insurance fraud this time, they were gonna go back to Bill Mueller's place, steal the guns, steal the cash, steal the coins, and that's how they were gonna fund the rest of their activities. And so that's, that's actually what happened. So Chevy and his buddy went back to Bill Mueller's house. They knew they had the stuff there um, and went ahead and uh, stole it, tortured, tortured the eight-year-old girl uh, with a cattle prod, of all things, um, to get Kirby to talk or, or, or Bill Mueller to talk about where everything was stashed. And so, um, yes, yeah, so that's a horrible little detail about that. Boy, I just brought the whole room down. Um, but uh, that's, so that's, that's, you know, Chevy learned very well from Kirby uh, about how to do that. And, um, and so again, there were, it's just tough looking at this slide, right? Because it's like there, are, there were places where this could have been diverted, right? Places where this could have gone in a different direction, uh, but didn't. Um, and so there's, there's, there's kind of the, the, the broad context about this, but obviously, we, you know, we, we don't, I don't just want to tell a terrible story and then leave you. <laughs> like, here's something super horrific and, 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 you know, and depressing. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, I didn't want to do that to you. So what, what, can, what can we learn from this, right? That, that eventually, we, I, I, I want to try and think about and I'm open to a discussion about this too, right? If you have ideas and thoughts about this, because I think this could be a cool conversation, but it's like, how might we take his very limited situation and are there broader principles that we can take away? I think there are. And so the first of which is very, is very micro, right? That if we want to understand someone's life as they move through time, you have to understand that the potential for these turning points. And this is a big idea in criminology, been around for a long time. Um, but this idea of there, there are certain events that happen that can affect your trajectory both in, in good and bad ways, right? Things can be very positive. Things can be very negative. Um, but there's no doubt that, that we, and we all have this, you know, telescope back in your own life, the things that happen to you that put you on a path that was great, other times put you on a path that sucked, and you had to kind of claw your way back, right? But we, we can look at his life through that, that, that there were certainly some turning points and pathways with Chevy school, military, family, that if any three of those things were different, he probably has a significantly different life, right? Bill Mueller and his family probably have a significantly different life, right? And so we can think about it in these kind of micro, very personal terms, and I think that's very useful. But 
I don't think it's useful to just think in those terms. All right? um, there, I think there's some broader, more macro level things that we can really start to think about. Um, and and with, this, with this whole white power movement, one of the threads that I see running through here is this loss of legitimacy in institutions. And man, we are right in the thick of that right now. 2022, we're seeing that, absolutely. Like what, what about when you start thinking about faith in elections? We, we've lost confidence in that, right? Schools, the military, right? Whenever there is this, this loss of, of legitimacy, um, and again, with, with, the, with the white power movement and the movement that Chevy was involved in, think of Ruby Ridge, Waco, right? All of this served to reinforce the, the absence of legitimacy of the federal government, right? Again, Ruby Ridge, remember Ruby Ridge, Randy Weaver? Again, that was right in my backyard, Northwest. I remember that on TV every day, right? Waco, Texas, same thing. But the, the message to this particular movement was the same, right? That you can't count on them. You can't count on the FBI. You can't count on the federal government. They're illegitimate, right? And as we know, nature abhors a vacuum, right? So when you remove that legitimacy from these institutions, something is going to take its place. Something has to come in and fill that void, right? And that's where this idea of this kind of toxic trilogy, I think, comes in. It's for this particular group, right? The, the, the merging of Christian identity with very clear racist overtones and, of, and of the importance of firearms took that place, right? You, you lose the institutional legitimacy, something comes in, and this is what came in. Absolutely. All right. And so the, this, this idea, I think, of institutional legitimacy is really, really, really important. Um, so the question becomes, well, how do you get it, <laughs> right? How can we enhance that? And... I have a couple ideas about this. Maybe, maybe you'll think there's some insight in there, or maybe not. Maybe you'll think I'm full of it, which is fine. It wouldn't be the first time. Um, but uh, I, I, I think, and the reason I think this is important is because we're seeing it right now. Right? We're seeing it right now. Uh, I have, um, I'm blessed to have friends across the political spectrum. And I've got, I've got friends that are hardcore left wing. I've got hardcore right wing, everything in between, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Absolutely love it. Life is never boring. Um, but I've, I've got a, a, a lot of friends that, that they're not part of this movement, but man, they can probably see the movement from where they're at. They can reach out and touch it. They're, they're not that far away, right? And, um, and they're all heavily armed, heavily armed. Um, and there's this, this idea of, again, not quite Christian identity, but not that far away from it either. And, you know, um, I have one buddy in particular, we'll call him Bobby to preserve his anonymity, right? But this is the kind of guy that believes that women shouldn't be pastors, that, that kind of thing. He's got an arsenal at his house. And when the, when the Uvalde thing hit, uh, and I said I wasn't going to talk about this, but what the hell I'm doing, uh, it, it affected him deeply because his, his, the, it reinforced everything in him that he needs to be packing every day, everywhere, because no one's coming to help you. And that was, that was his thing to me, like, ain't, you can't count on anybody. No one's coming for you. You got you to protect yourself. And so he's usually carrying two handguns at any given time. Got a primary and a backup. And this is not a, I'll, I'll get to that. He's not, a, he's not in law enforcement. He, he, he works for the Parks Department in Western Washington. He puts water on grass for a living and he's armed to the teeth every day, right? And, but, but this is out there, right? And so there, I, there's no doubt in my mind that we're seeing kind of an institutional, crisis might be a hard word. I don't know, I wanna to be too alarmist on that, but I'm old enough to remember when <laughs> we thought about this differently, right? And so we're, we're certainly, I think we're seeing a, a, a loss of legitimacy now that, we've, that, that we haven't seen in my lifetime anyway, for sure. Yeah, you had a question about it? Mm -hmm. Chevy, if you look at it that way, would you see this as this movement and them, or just them as like an outlier? And I, when we see normally like talking about a father, even though we say his name here in El Paso, violent young men that get radicalized, normally it's a very, very different path, correct? Where yeah. they have a lack of a role model, a lack of a feeling of belonging, 
isolation. That's how throughout the spectrum, you know, left, right, right. Uh, not just in the United States, worldwide, usually young men that are radicalized are looking for someone to right. belong to. They're disaffected, they're not bonded, yeah. And that, I, I would say that's probably the majority, right? So this movement you're saying, is that what I'm taking away from this, that the broad implications is just for this movement where it is like family-based, right. um, like you're even saying, people are not quite part of it, but right. they try to touch it, it it's... I would say that's accurate. Yeah, I, I think this this particular movement that Chevy was in is is yeah because they weren't unbonded necessarily. They were bonded to antisocial people, which isn't great, right? Um, but they weren't necessarily the kind of disaffected alone kind of thing. No, and that's 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 a different. I think that's a, a, an incredibly difficult problem on its own, right? It's a bigger problem. Yeah. No, no. I I think I think you're right. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't know. That's that's an open question because again, you've got these tiny little cells scattered all over that that really keep to themselves, and so I I'm not sure I'm not sure how localized that really is at this point. It, it may be, it may not be, right? Um, but I, I I agree with you that this is absolutely not the only pathway to this. This this is this is but one, and it was Chevy's, right? But others others follow definitely um, different um, different pathways for sure. Uh, no, this is this is the only one that he really got wrapped up in. His uh, his partner in this particular offense, uh, he'd done time for homicide before, uh, and he just got executed a couple years ago uh, for this for this offense as well. Um, kind of similarities in the sense that we see a lot of um, sometimes even like the violent gangs or transnational organizations. A lot of the violence, the actual real violence, always seems to be internal. And you're saying yeah. that Mr. Miller, obviously his family and his wife and kids should not have, you know, but it seems to Right. That and that's that's it right there. That's the that's the big one, right? Is that um, when they do go internal? Uh, and first of all, when you say this is an outlier, absolutely it's an outlier because of the, of the level of violence. Like most people who are entrenched in this movement aren't doing anything like this, right? Nothing like this at all. And so this really is an extreme form of that. But when the violence does turn inward, that's that's the process that's at work, right there that they're gonna sell the movement out or they're gonna talk or they're going to squeal, they're going, or they're just, or go back to Kirby, just not tough enough, right? You don't have, you don't have what it takes to kind of uh, lead and participate in this movement. We're gonna have the bigger picture. When you see civil wars in any nation, they're always usually more violent. You know, when, when it's internal, you're gonna see a lot more just rapid yeah. violence and, and viciousness that sometimes you don't even see when it's the group that's there. Sure. I mean, that's the, you know, that was always the, 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 big, the big knock with the Nazis, right? Who, who were the first people that the Nazis came for their own? You know, and that's 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 a pretty stable pattern for sure. Um, and so this this idea of of enhancing legitimacy, how do you how do you do that? Yes, sir. I would I would just add to sure. his comment that this this uh, what was the what was the religious religious Christian identity. Christian identity? Yeah. People people will also come to that as isolated, disaffected people too. I actually knew somebody in the Pullman, Washington area who had moved from, I guess, New Hampshire. And he was disaffected, he was a loner, and he joined that movement. Yeah. So in these, in these movements, you can kind of come to it organically through your family, or you can come to it you know, as kind of a loner right. looking for something. No, and that's, a, and that's a great point, Ted, because like that, that Christian identity thing is both a consequence and a cause, right? And so for, for someone like Kirby, Kirby already had those beliefs, right? He already had the racist beliefs, the, the arming himself and all that stuff. And so for him, the Christian identity was reinforcing something that I already believe, right? So he didn't, he didn't have to go very far to adopt that, right? It was, it was, it was, it was in many ways, it was you know, a chicken and the egg kind of thing um, where, where his racism and all that kind of stuff came first. The Christian identity came second to kind of reinforce that. For Chevy, it wasn't, right? For Chevy, that came first, right? That was in the house all day, every day, right? So that, that, was the, that was an immediate context for him, right? And so uh, it, it's really interesting to see where in the process something like that religion fits with this, right? For, so for some, it, it, I think it really is causal. For some, not so much, right? For some, it's, it's, a, it's a post hoc justification for stuff they already thought, right? Um, one of the great lines, you ever, you ever watched the show Justified by chance? 
oh, you're missing out. It's so good. It's, it's been gone for a while, but uh, it's based on some Elmore Leonard novels. I don't know if you ever read any Elmore Leonard. Elmore Leonard is fantastic. So if you, yeah. But it was this great show. Just, it had one of the best bad guys ever in TV, Boyd Crowder. Um, I like me a good bad guy. Uh, and, uh, but it, Boyd was one of these characters that adopted the language of Christian identity. You look at the pilot episode of Justified, and he's spouting off straight Christian identity stuff. It's fascinating, right? And uh, the, the main character, Raylan Givens, who I named a little cat after. I had a little cat named Little Raylan Givens. <laughs> Raylan, Raylan Givens says, you know, I think, Boyd, you just want to use the Bible to do whatever the hell you were going to do anyway. Right? And that, that's the way I kind of see Kirby with this, is that he just used Christian identity to do what he wanted to do anyway. Um, a, a little bit, but he wasn't a terribly charismatic guy because he was a jerk, right? Chevy was on the other end of that. Chevy was a pretty charismatic dude. Chevy had an ability to get people to follow him because, because he was interpersonally very good. And he, you know, had a full mouth full of teeth and everything else. And so he looked the part, he sounded the part. He was, you know, he could, he could play that game much better than Kirby could for sure. Yeah. So what happened to Shane? And what are your thoughts on Shane? Uh, Shane, um... Shane, test, Shane and his mom both testified against Chevy in the trial. And so they have no contact with him at all. I, I think they moved down to, they move around a lot. Um, I, last I checked, they were in Arkansas, I believe. Um, but they're, uh, I'd have to do a where are they now kind of thing and track him, him and, his, and his mom down. But it, public records are going to be tough because, man, they like to get off the grid. But uh, they, yeah, they both testified against him. Um, and, and at one point, Chevy was threatening chain, like, you know, because they, after the shootout, that, that jumping out of the suburban and everything, there was another shootout there, but they, they left, they ended up in the hills of Utah for years, um, working odd jobs, manual labor stuff. And, uh, Shane said repeatedly in the trial that he was in fear of his life, that he wanted to get out. He wanted to leave, but Chevy's like, you leave, I'll kill you, you know? And I, you know, I don't know how much that was real or how much that was rhetoric, but given that Chevy seemed to, to not have much of a problem killing, um, probably would have believed him on that. But yeah, yes. So that's probably why they move around a lot, right? Because they're yeah. afraid that they might send somebody after them after so many years. And yeah. Not and and so, yeah, and, and that's just it. It's like they're they're still. I, my guess is that they're still at least even if they're on the periphery, they're still in the movement. And so there's the, the need to kind of stay off the grid. Um, I mean, they, you know, Chevy's house, when, when back in junior high, it didn't, it didn't have any power. No power, no running water. I mean, they were, they're fully off the grid. And, and that was not an accident. That was by design um, because they were convinced that, you know, the, the UN had Black Hawk helicopters that they were going to come in and follow the road signs that were marked in the back and everything else and, um, and come get them. That's a, that's a, a real belief that they have. Um, if you've ever gone to like, uh, have you ever gone to any gun shows by chance? Love them. Love the death. Gun shows are awesome, right? It's for, if, you're, if you like people watching, like gun shows and airports, man, those two things are just, they're, they're a, a never ending treasure trove of, of people watching, right? And I, I remember I was, oh, shoot, probably 20, 19, 20 or whatever, and there was a, a gun show in, in Missoula we went to and so the militia of Montana had a booth set up and they had their their constitution and their literature um, and so I picked some up and I was talking to this dude and it was, I was I was this cocky smart ass 20 year old you know and I, I'm, I'm reading their pamphlets correcting their grammar and saying you don't need a comma there and you know and and and, and but and it, yeah so but it was fascinating it's fascinating the things that they that they will believe that you know um, that you've got uh, the UN has these sophisticated weather machines that cause hurricanes and tornadoes, et cetera. Et cetera was in the, in the pamphlet. Like, et cetera, what, and I asked the guy, what, well, what's in the et cetera? <laughs> what falls in there, you know? Um, he didn't have an answer, but yeah. Um, but it's, it's fascinating stuff. And again, it's still, it's still active. It, it's absolutely still active. Um, yes? Well, I wanted to address what you had originally said about the pockets and knowing where they are. The FBI actually has a task force, the Sovereign Citizen Task Force, that is in Austin, Texas, at the DPS Fusion Cell Headquarters, that is 
as members of TDCJ, TABC, and a bunch of other agencies that solely follow these people. These people, all of them, religious zealots, religious freedomists, uh, sovereign citizens, and their only job, not the only job, but part of their job is to follow them on social media, become members on social media of those groups, and to see what they're doing. So they are followed, they are active, and they are around. In fact, we probably see them walking by. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it hasn't gone away. They are everywhere. Gone away. I was one of the people that was actually on that task force. Wow. I would be walking through public, and I'd be like, oh, crap, I know that guy. <laughs> and then I'd be with my wife and be like, let's leave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, awesome. Well, I, I have one final point I'd like to get to um, about this, this, this notion of legitimacy. Uh, we have a, a pretty good literature on this now in, in, in criminal justice and criminology about procedural justice and procedural fairness. And, and a lot of this has to do with policing, but it's not limited to that. Uh, it's, it's applied to court settings and, and, and judicial processes and everything. It's this idea of treating the process as fairly as you can. And, and, and think about yourself. Like, let's say, let's say you, you had, you know, something happened to you or you wanted something and you had to go through some process to get it and you ended up getting it, but you hated the process. Like, you feel like you didn't get treated fairly during that process. Even if you get what you want, you're still not happy. You're still not happy with how that went. It's like, you know, you get through this like, okay, yeah, I got what I wanted, but ugh, I wouldn't go through that again. It was terrible, right? And on the other side of that, if you say you want something, you want something and you go through a procedure and you think that you've been treated fairly and the process is fairly, even if you don't get what you want, even if at the end of that you're like, you know, it didn't turn out my way, but you know what? It's all good. I felt like I was treated fairly. I felt like I got a fair shake. I wasn't, you know, whatever. You end up actually feeling okay with it, right? And so this is something that's, that's been going on, in, 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 certainly in the policing literature for a long time now, is this idea of procedural fairness. That the rules that you use for your behavior, the rules that you use to govern your agency and your practices should be fair, they should be transparent, they should be open, right? So that way nothing's hidden, nothing's, nothing's back-channeled or anything like that, so that even if people don't get the outcome they want in, a, in a, maybe a police citizen contact, Right? Even if they don't get the outcome that they wanted, they still feel as though that they were treated fairly. So that actually ends up enhancing the legitimacy of that institution. So people, even if someone got arrested, right, they'll come away from that thinking, you know what, I, I kind of had that coming. You know, I, got, I, I got treated fairly, I got treated with respect, I had an outcome that I really didn't want, but I, but I still view the, the police as legitimate. right? versus even if you got something out of that interaction that you, that you wanted, but you thought that that interaction went in a direction that was unfair or discriminatory in some way, you're not going to view the police as legitimate. You're just not, right? And so this idea of procedural fairness, procedural justice, I think is, is fundamental to this. And again, I, I know that that's, it's not a cure-all and it's not easy to do by any stretch, right? Um, but this is, this is a variable that I think social institutions should really consider more carefully than they are right now about, about being concerned about their own legitimacy and about what they are doing to either enhance that or undermine it. Um, and we see this with police, we see it with schools, we see it with the judicial process, um, that when the, when the procedures look unfair or hidden or too ideologically motivated or biased, even if you get the outcome you want, you're still not all that happy about it, right? Uh, so that, that's where I think... Um, this, when we start thinking about what can we do about this, <laughs> um, I know this, this idea may, may seem a little bit removed from it, uh, but I, I do think it's incredibly important, this idea of, of legitimacy. Hold on just a quick second. That's, that's all I got. So, yes. Yeah, I think to that point, just to contextualize this just a little bit, I think of in the modern sense now, uh, following the, just to pick an incident, the 2008 financial crisis, for example, we saw the Occupy Wall Street was banging down the doors of Congress, well, banging down the doors of Wall Street, rather, so they were camped out outside of the building, uh, demanding that the government institutions that basically allowed Wall Street through the subprime uh, mortgage-backed securities uh, scam, let's call it what it is, uh, were essentially not just got bailed out scot-free, they were um, paid off and basically benefited from it. Uh, they were said, we're not going to hold you liable. In fact, all the money that you lost doing this very risky move that tanked the global economy, uh, we're going to give you all that money back. In 
And where does that money come from? It's going to come from the same people whose houses you just gambled away. Mm -hmm. um, as, as sort of a response to that, we've seen time and time again the, the sort of government response has repeatedly been, well, we can't issue a stimulus to these people. That, that's preposterous. Like, if you give people uh, money, that's going to tank the entire economy. Instead, we're going to give uh, the huge financial institutions absorbent, absorbent amounts of money. Ridiculous amounts of money, money amounts of money that don't actually have like uh, more commas than a normal person would probably be counting, honestly. And what sort of effect we see of this is that this understanding where these um, these rackos are legitimized to an extent, where they have this understanding that big government's not going to come bail them out. As an anecdote, uh, there's a story about this town of Alfreda, I believe. There was a stranger who wrote in one fine day, and he hardly talked to those around him, didn't have much to say. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> thank you. That's a perfect note to end on. I really appreciate you being here. Um, so thank you. <laughs>